If there's one thing I remember about me dad, it's that he was a great storyteller. Every night he used to start his stories at the dead table. That was the time after we'd had our feet at night, but before mum got up to do the dishes. It was simple food in those days. After school, mum would give us our piece, and at night it might be rabbit with fresh veggies from the garden. My dad had the best veggie garden in the street. We'd always be full and satisfied with our food. But those stories, well, each of us boys had our favourite, and we used to ask him to repeat them over and over again. Most of them came from all the different jobs he'd had. He was a jack of all trades, really. And in them days, there was always a way to make a few extra pennies on the side. My brother Colin's favourite story came from when Dad had been a bottle blower up at AGM in Spotswood. He'd been a peace worker, and he used to work with this guy who never had a belt to do his pants up properly. He used to hitch them up, reach into the kill for the molten glass, and start blowing it into the shape. And he wouldn't touch his pants again until the piece was complete. Sometimes that meant by the time he's finished, if it hadn't gone well, that his pants would be down at the floor. Well, Colin used to think that was the funniest story he'd ever heard. I liked the ones that came from when he ran fishing trips and seen him tours from his boat. My favourite was the one about the party of gentlemen from the city who came out onto the boat with a niner. That's a keg of beer, you know. Well, Dad told them it was going to be a bit rough and that it wasn't a good idea to be out on the open water, but they insisted they wanted to go anyway. As soon as Dad got past Breakwater Pier, it really got choppy and the gentleman insisted he turn back. They were feeling a bit crook at the time. My dad was a non-drinker, but the gentleman told him he could do what he liked with the beer because they were too sick to care about it. On his way home, dad wandered past the pub and told a few of the blokes about the keg and invited them back for a drink. Well, that night, even after midnight, Dad had wives knocking on his door, giving him hell for getting the husbands drunk. And the publican, well, he was even angrier and told Dad next time he had that much beer for sale, he was to sell it to him rather than going into opposition. Me Dad wasn't harsh, but he was firm and he'd do anything for a penny. I was his favourite, so I always got to help him. One Christmas, he bought me this little red cart with ball bearing wheels. Well, I tell you in them days, a set of ball bearing wheels meant you a king of the boys. When it wasn't used for work, me, Colin and the gang from our street used to race it down the middle of the road. But on Saturdays, I used to go up the street and collect orders for vegetables off the neighbours. For sixpence, Dad would give you one bunch of six red beets and a good firm head of lettuce. I'd come back and tell Dad what the orders were. He'd then cut up the veggies, wrap them in a newspaper and put them in a cart, and I'd deliver them. I used to do the same with the rabbits, but that was a bit different. He used to trap them down near the reserve at Point Cook and sell them for nine pence a pair, unless there was something a bit wrong with them. Then he'd knock something off the price. On Sunday, Colin and I used the cart to go to the Strand and collect beer bottles from where the drunks had left them on Saturday night. The bottler would give us ten pence a dozen. That was our pocket money. I'm telling you, that cart sure did come in handy. My dad's last job was with Ports and Harbours and his boss was Charlie Curry. Charlie used to drop round on payday and give me mum and dad's pay when he was laying out. On those days when wharfies were needed down at the reserve, groups of stevedores used to gather down at Ann Street in Williamstown. They were special men who'd come off the wharves because they'd been trained in the handling of explosives. I mean, you couldn't have someone going in there half drunk, throwing his weight or cases around. I remember they had to have special canvas rubber soled shoes because if you had hobnails, which was all the rage in them days, well, if you struck a nail on the deck, it might cause a spark and start an explosion. Dad's job was to lay out in the lighters, sleeping in a little cabin 
that was in the hull of the lighter right next to the explosives. You see, sometimes the lighter would be stacked with explosives and taken out to the anchorage point where it was to rendezvous with a steamship. Once the explosives had been transferred onto that ship, the ship would transport them round Australia where they'd be used for mining, quarrying, dam building, road construction and tunnelling. But sometimes there'd be no ship waiting to meet the lighter, so someone had to lay out for a few nights at a time to make sure no harm came to the explosives. You see, they were not allowed to bring the lighters back into Williamstown port, even with one case of explosives in it. Can you imagine if there was an explosion in Williamstown? That could have wiped out all of Victoria's import and export industry. When you lay out, you had to provide your own food and tucker. But for every night you stayed out, you'd get the princely sum of five shillings. They say that there's never been any explosions out at the reserve, but accidents, well, that's another story. One night when Dad was laying out and we were having our evening meal, we heard Charlie Curry coming up the side of the house. Well, we guessed it was him. I mean, it wasn't paid or anything, but it sounded like him. Charlie came into the kitchen, which was pretty rare. Normally he'd just knock on the door and leave the pay with Mum. Charlie said Dad had been involved in an accident at work. Dad was in hospital at Footscray, and he thought one of us should go and see how Dad was. It turns out that in the heavy seas, the anchor from the lighter had become stuck in the mud. Well, when that happens, the way to get the anchor out of the mud is to turn the hand winch to pick up the slack in the chain each time the bow of the lighter dips in the swell. You had to keep repeating this until the bow was directly over the anchor and you could pull it up out of the mud. On this particular occasion, the pull on the winch slipped and as a result, the handle came around and struck Dad across the top of the eyes, throwing him back across the lighter. They radioed ahead for an ambulance to meet them at the end of the old town up here. The men told me later that this was the first time a vehicle had ever been down that pier. I must have been 14 at the time and I don't think I'd ever been on a bus before and I sure didn't know where the hospital was. But Mum said I had to be the one to go so she gave me the bus fare and somehow I made my way down there. In them days you didn't go to hospital unless it was really serious. So, as a man of the family, I had to go. When I got to the hospital, the nurse took me into this room, and there was my dad, lying on this bed, covered in bandages and not moving at all. He had the blackest pair of eyes you'd ever seen, and his mouth was all wrinkled and shrunken. I've never seen my dad with no teeth in. I didn't even know that he had false teeth. I thought dad was dead. He looked so sick and pale. I sat by the bed and I spoke to him. Talked to him softly, told him funny stories. The stories he'd always told me at the dead table. Probably comforting me more than him. And for a while I sat in silence. Then he spoke back. Oh, and I knew everything was going to be all right. When he got out of hospital and recovered, they sent him back to work for just one day to give him a farewell party. You see, he never really fully recovered from the accident, so he had to retire. But he still had his money-making schemes. He used his loom to weave scarves, and he used to go back to the reserve to collect the used rope off the lighters to turn them into doormats and sell them. I've still got one outside my front door. Well, better he took them than to see them go down to the tip. I mean, they were 18 foot length. Dad used to pull each strand out and plait them. Then he'd knit them together and sell them. And of course, there was always his veggies. Even today, when I dig my garden over, it's Dad that's digging, it's not me. He'd say, hold that shovel vertical, push it right in as far as it will go, tilt it back and put it on your knee, and turn it from top to bottom. He loved that garden, it kept him strong, and it kept us fed. Yes, we may have had our raggedy pants and patches on our shirts, but we were always satisfied, and after a good feed, well, we still share our stories. <laughs>